Uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I, I, I know that, that, you know, the topic of mental health uh, has gained justified, you know, notoriety in, in recent years. There are real issues that are impacting large segments of populations worldwide. Uh, today, what we intend to do is focus on the special challenges uh, that are faced by elite athletes uh, with either high profiles or, or, or those athletes who perform for teams with high visibility. Um, I learned very early in my uh, professional career, uh, I'm a sports agent, uh, and uh, I learned early in my career that many athletes face uh, what we call stressors, uh, uh, and that these stressors are, are, can be very unique um, uh, given the status of the high profile and often wealthy professional athletes, that there are normal things that happen uh, to, to, to professional athletes uh, that impact them very differently then they might impact someone who's not a high profile uh, athlete. Uh, there are also these unique things, often unbelievable things uh, that happen to them due to their status as high profile professional athletes. Um, there are many stressors uh, that we'll get into a little bit later that are exacerbated by the fact that athletes uh, are relatively young uh, and uh, often generally immature. Um, but all athletes, regardless of where they are in their, in their maturation process, uh, are susceptible to, to, to what we, I like to call conflict spiraling, uh, which is what happens when uh, an initial stressor ends up being managed poorly. Um, and so something that happens bad ends up getting worse and worse and worse simply because it was not addressed uh, at the onset very effectively. My name's Joby Branion, as, 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 uh, as you know. I uh, graduated from Duke. I played football at Duke, uh, hence the background. Uh, I, I was there uh, when the football team was better than the basketball team, which was a very long time ago. Uh, I graduated um, with a double major in political science and philosophy, and then I went to uh, work in the admissions office at Duke after I got cut by the NFL. Um, spent about six years doing that. Went to law school and business school out of UCLA. Practiced law for a minute hated it. And then I became a sports agent, which was now 26 years ago. Um, so I've been doing this as my livelihood for, uh, for a good long time. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by an incredibly distinguished panel, uh, Dr. Herb Martin, uh, Rebecca Riley, uh, and Matt Shaw. Uh, Dr. Martin, I've known for now about 23 or 24 years. He's a PhD psychologist uh, who graduated from the University of Michigan. Uh, has made working with pro and amateur athletes his life work for well over 30 years. Uh, and he's worked with many, in, uh, he's worked with the, N the NBA, the NFL, uh, many NCAA uh, institutions, as well as the teams and the athletes. Uh, I'll let him get a little, little bit more into his background when we get to him. Uh, Rebecca Riley and I met uh, as freshmen together at Duke. Uh, she was an engineering student and uh, well, clearly had a different experience than I did. Uh, and she graduated with a much better GPA than I did. She went on to earn her law degree from UC Hastings uh, College of Law, uh, worked for the Los Angeles Public Defender's Office for more than a decade, uh, and for the past 20 plus years uh, has worked in part with professional athletes among her other many, cli many other clients. Um, Matt Schaub was uh, the ACC Player of the Year at UVA uh, 20 years ago. Uh, he, had a, he has had a 17-year NFL career as a quarterback for four different franchises. Matt has literally, uh, and I was, truth be told, I was Matt's agent uh, for the vast majority of that time. Uh, Matt has literally experienced nearly everything during his career. He, was, he went from being a backup to a starter to the face of a franchise to a pro bowler. Uh, he's been traded. He's been injured. He's been cut. Uh, he's been honored. He's been scapegoated. He's been celebrated and vilified. Uh, I remember there was a point even when they were burning his jerseys in the uh, uh, outside the stadium in the parking lot in, in, in Houston. So he has experienced the highs and the lows uh, of, of professional sports, specifically the NFL. And I think we'll have a lot to offer uh, in our panel. Uh, we have more ground to cover here than we have time available to us. So I want to go ahead and just sort of get started. I'm going to, I'm going to pivot to Dr. Martin with our, our first question. Uh, which is a big fat pitch for you, Doc. Um, the sports industry, in your opinion, as a whole, pro, and I think we have to now include college because really a lot of these college programs are like small pro 
uh, 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 institutions. Um, do, what kind of role do you think they have to play in addressing how athletes uh, private and public lives are impacted by the special mental health issues that are created by their sports? That's a great question. And I certainly believe that they have a role and, and a responsibility. And I think if we look at the last 10 years, you've seen, as you mentioned before, the proliferation of programs that are designed to uh, assist players. So, uh, if you look at the National Football League, and I can really probably speak more to the NBA and the, and, and the National Football League. Um, last year, well, two years ago, there was the behavioral health agreement between the NFLPA and the, and the league, uh, which is designed specifically to address the needs of players. Uh, and the uh, NBA has a similar program uh, around wellness, mental health and wellness. So there's clearly been an effort and a focal point around the needs of players. So I think that clearly this is something that has taken place that really has value. I think the organizations, I think the league recognizes the importance of that. And with all of that being said, I believe that there are opportunities to further enhance the efforts that have been made. Uh, namely, I believe that many of the players that we work with are, are tied to their families. And I, I don't think, let me just put it this way. I believe that there are, there are opportunities to educate family members a lot more because that's certainly one of the challenges for players. I think Matt could speak to that. The second area I think is really important is coaches. You know, coaches, I mean, the players are dealing with coaches every day. And I'm not always, and it hasn't always been my experience that coaches, not all the coaches, but many coaches are not aware of the impact that even their coaching styles may have upon players. And I think that this is part of a systemic approach that I think needs to be considered when we're talking about mental health today. Lastly, and I'm sure that there's much more, but I, I think that the idea of prevention is something that we really need to look at, both in terms of working with players directly, but also in terms of working with coaches and family members. So that requires a great deal of education and also just fundamentally time. You know, in pro sports and particularly football, you know, most of the time is allocated towards the player and, and you know, film and practice. But I mean, one can argue and, uh, that there needs to be much more time dedicated to the players uh, and their development throughout the course of their careers. And so that generally will come from the organization and, and that differs among 32 teams in the National Football League. So it, it really requires a, a shift culturally around what we think about mental health. And I think that we're seeing that and my hope is that it'll continue in the direction of educating players and also making players where there's time that is allocated to players to help them with issues, not only when they're in crisis, but also along their you know, trajectory during the course of their careers. Sorry, as a, as a follow up to that, um, would you say in your decades of experience that a lot, uh, what, what percentage of the things that you encounter that, that um, you know, that you're obviously uh, uh, well-versed to handle, what, what percentage of the things that you encounter would you say uh, could have been avoided proactively had there been some sort of, of educational component or um, I think you and I have had many conversations about raising uh, an athlete's self-awareness before they run into what will be almost inevitably some type of stress that they encounter. Uh, how, mu how much is proactive versus, how much could have been addressed proactively as opposed to just reactively after, you know, the tragedy or the, or the issue uh, happened? I think it's a great question. And I also think that, you know, colleges are doing a great, uh, are really making a, a strong effort to address this. So a lot of the players that I see today have counselors, have sports psychologists, or have people that they, or programs that are designed to educate them. But again, to me, it's just really the allocation of time, how much time that they spend. But I also wanna answer a question that actually came up for me today. And this player was really distraught, you know, having difficult, in fact, asked the head coach, could he take off a few days, which would have been unheard of, maybe even two or three years ago. The coach allowed the player to have the time off. But the fundamental issue that the player was dealing with was not having enough time, not having a real clear sense of 
where he was going in the future. You know, is he going to get playing time? Uh, is he going to be respected by his coaches? You know, all of these expectations that were placed upon him, he really didn't have control over. And so I really began to think about this because it's come up numerous times, actually, even this, this week, where if we were able to teach players to really understand, as they say often, control what I can control, you know, <laughs> really working with players at the high school collegiate level, and certainly at the pro level to recognize that they can have control, more control of their lives if they take control of their lives. And what I mean by that is not only psychologically, emotionally, but also financially, finding out other things. For example, this, this young man um, really felt that this is all that he could do. And that's reinforced, as you know, all of you guys know this. And you know, uh, Matt, that you get rewarded for not starting a, a McDonald's. You, you don't get rewarded for that. You get rewarded for playing or being at the facility. And you may not develop other parts of yourself early on. And I think that that is a detriment to many players because they can't determine whether or not a coach allows them to play always. They can't determine whether or not they are gonna be able to um, play longer than four years or whatever the, you know, the statistics are. But what they can do is develop parts of themselves. And I think that that discussion can start very early on. To, to, to piggyback on that concept, I know one of the things that I've, I've made a, a big part of, of, of my communication with young athletes as we start working with them is that going back to what you just said, there are things in life you just can't control, right? Which means it's crazy not to control the things you can control. Absolutely. And one of the most important things you can control is who you surround yourself with. Right. If you surround yourself with uh, people who truly care about your best interests and professionals who can help you in ways that you're you're maybe not yourself prepared to uh uh to to cope with with things in certain lanes you're ready to play you're not ready to deal with the money you're not ready to deal with the stress that comes with being the instant breadwinner uh in your family all of a sudden you're the youngest person and the one that the entire family is now relying on right uh there are just so many things that you're just not you're ill-equipped to to manage, but if you have good people around you who are there to, to support you in each of those different lanes, you've increased your chances for success. Yeah, no so, doubt. And, yeah. and more, moreover, Joby, you have a sense of the direction in the course of life that you have the control over. And, and so, I, I mean, just that illustration, that's something that someone can do by picking up the phone mm -hmm. and or not responding to certain calls. Or, you know, uh, and so uh, that's, that's very powerful and it's very important for players to understand because every player has a day where they have to end up not playing because they, not because they want to necessarily. So it's, it's definitely something that can be started uh, much earlier on. Or... That's a great, and it's a great segue to uh, what I wanted to talk about with you, Rebecca. Um, obviously you are a, a, a practicing lawyer with a criminal background, criminal law background, um, have been dealing with, with professional athletes off and on, um, uh, more on than off in recent years. Uh, and you've seen from your vantage point, um, how athletes end up getting into situations that require, uh, uh, some legal advice, right? They either need to be represented to defend themselves against something that happened because of their, 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 their in part because of their sport, uh, or something happened to them that requires them to go after somebody else. Uh, like we, we mentioned, or we've, uh, you and I have talked about the, the work you did with Drew Brees. Um, in, in your experience, um, how do you, from your perspective, see the connection between, um, you know, the things that happen to these, 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 uh, these athletes, these professional athletes and overall mental health, um, because you've had to deal with it from, from very different perspectives. Well, one thing <clears throat> I have a bit of a call to my voice is even stranger today, Joby than usual, but, uh, <clears throat> one thing that I don't, I don't know that I heard you mention in your intro is that you have a sports agency, uh, Vanguard. And I was thinking in terms of this panel today, um, 
about the team approach and how I've learned from you, how important it is that there's a team approach to the extent that that's possible with players or frankly with sort of uh, any individual who's put into any of these situations. Um, you know, I was thinking that uh, <clears throat> the, the, there's that Twilight Zone episode of the, the kid and I know that I can't see anybody that's listening to us, but they probably never heard of the Twilight Zone. But there's an episode of a young boy who um, has the power to wish people into the cornfield. I don't know if you, Joby, or her, probably Matt's too young to have ever heard of that. But because he could wish people into the cornfield, right, all the adults around him catered to him and wanted, uh, no matter what he wanted, he was right. He was always right. He had to be happy or else you're gone. And I think that um, with some of these uh, young athletes um, and even older athletes, because it started when they were young, that people around them, you know, when you see what happened with uh, poor Dominique Dawes or the other um, during the Olympic sort of season and the gymnastics and um, uh, was it the skater recently? Russian figure skater. The Russian figure skater that these young people have sort of been put into these bubbles where they're, they're catered to for their talent and their ability to bring in money or fame or accolades, but they aren't really looked at as the human beings that they are in terms of what they need to succeed in life. And I, that hits on both what you and Herb were also saying. And so I think when it comes to the um, aspect of the law, I, I have found that it is important to be able to work with you, Herb, with you, Joby, um, we've worked with financial advisors. We work as a team when a client has a particular problem and I can't solve any one problem. They make decisions sometimes that impact criminal law um, be because of, because anybody does, human beings make mistakes, but also because they're in a position where they are targeted often um, by outside forces because of their notoriety, because of their fame. Um, and so to the extent that mental health has impacted the decisions they make, it can be anywhere on a spectrum, right? From they're having a bad day and so they act impulsively and therefore they need me, they need a lawyer. Um, they have an uh, interaction with somebody on Instagram that they probably shouldn't have had. Those kinds of things happen because they are targeted by being reached out to on Instagram because of who they are but they also respond impulsively because of sort of th this position they've been put in since they were young, where they get what they want immediately, sort of. And that uh, dynamic, and I was going to say that dynamic is exacerbated by the fact that they're just not mature enough and they're surrounded by enablers. I've, 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 enablers, I've preached yeah. these young people all the time that, that the biggest threat to your future is the endless line of enablers that are going to be out there telling you what you want to hear. And you've got to, and this is where Dr. Martin can come in and, and, and even you can come in to try and get these, these, these young athletes to understand the, the difference between somebody trying to uh, weasel their way into a relationship with you by telling you, you what you want to hear and people are being honest with you <laughs> because you have right. good, honest feedback. You have a better chance of making better decisions and it empowers you to have good people around you and don't be afraid of asking questions. Don't be afraid of being challenged. And don't, and don't be afraid of needing help, right? That's the mental health aspect is I do. I mean, I'm glad to hear Herb say that he feels that uh, the colleges are being more responsive. I, I frankly don't have much experience with that aspect of it. Um, but I do think that, that that mental health for too long has been seen as a stigma. And, it, it, you know, to the extent that there is a team, the family is included in that team, right? As well as professionals. And the family also sees that that's a stigma. And so you have to get through all of that to realize that in order to deal with this legal issue, in order to deal with this person's next step in their life and their career, we're gonna have to work together as a team and acknowledge that there are issues that have to be dealt with. Thank you. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that was a great answer. Go ahead, Herb. No, I was saying that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So, Matt, um, I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to bring up the horrible memory of your, your shirts being burned in effigy 
in uh <laughs> but i know there I were know a you, lot of good memories though that were yeah, absolutely before and after that and intertwined yeah no i'm sure i'm sure and i'm sure you actually have good memories of your visits to the the place over my shoulder um where where you you probably had great success <laughs> in any event i I'll let I, you I, say that yeah <laughs> Well, I, 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 what I'd really like from you, because I think the people that are listening in would, would maybe want to hear from you more than anybody, because you've you've walked this thing, right? You 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 came into the league as a as a a former ACC Player of the Year who immediately had to go to backup behind Michael Vick, right? And then you, I think you got like, would you have two starts, and then all of a sudden mm-hmm. you're traded and you're elevated to the you know given the keys of the city in in houston as the face of their franchise and given them you know really really attractive contract but suddenly had this new burden right um i i, I tell our clients all the time and, and dr martin at some point i want you to weigh in on this that that stressors aren't just bad things sometimes it's the best things that ever happen to you that create some of the most stressful situations like suddenly becoming the face of a franchise. Everybody wants to be the quarterback and the face of a team. Well, you you jumped into that, um, and I'd love for you to, to to you know talk a little bit about you know the, the your career and how how it really is a, 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 a truly a um, a roller coaster ride. Uh, and nobody's career just does this. Everybody's career goes up and down and up and down, especially in the sport of football with injuries and everything else going on, and and even more so for quarterbacks who take on an, an, an added burden, burden uh, that, that, that just doesn't happen in any other position in any other sport. Well, I think to unpack it all, I would need probably another two hours with everyone on this call uh, to unpack all the ebbs and flows that went into 17 years playing in the National Football League at quarterback position. But for me, you know, coming out as a third round pick, obviously I understood coming to the Atlanta Falcons, backing up Michael Vick, I knew my role. And that was why it's one thing about the quarterback position, you know, where you stand on the roster is I knew my role was to back up and to be ready in a moment's notice. Like you said, I had two starts. I played uh, a fair amount because the way Mike played, there was a lot of time that he missed within games and things like that. But I got a lot of time in the preseason to show what I could do. So it was for me relating it to college. It was like a red shirt experience. So I got to come in understand how being an NFL quarterback works, the day-to-day, the week-to-week, the media responsibilities. And and I was backing up at the time, one of the two most visible athletes in all the world, you had Michael Vick and Tiger Woods. And so I got to see how he handled the position from a media standpoint, from a locker room standpoint, from week-to-week, the ebbs and flows, the good and the bad, handling adversity. And so I was just cataloging a notebook of things that I, how I would handle them when I got the opportunity. And after my third year, that's when Houston came and traded for, for me in the spring of 2007. And so this was a dream come true, right? I mean, I was now the face of a franchise, as you said, Joby, and I was getting the opportunity to be the starting quarterback. And how was I going to handle it? Okay. And I've already cataloged all these things. And for me, it was jump right in and get to know my teammates because, yeah, there's so many things. If you get con- too consumed with the big picture and the city, the fans, expectations, all those things are going to be there no matter what team you're on. But if you just put the focus on the important things and that's how are you going to win football games? Because if you win football games, that takes care of a lot of stuff, right? That takes care of all that other noise that's going on. And so for me, it was, I'm going to win with my teammates. So let me get to know them the best and show them that I'm one of them. I'm just a guy coming in that wants to be the quarterback for them and to win football games with them. And when you focus on that at this position, the rest will take care of itself. But you have to have that foundation, that knowledge and that understanding that to be really good at what you want to do and and handle the expectations and everything You got to do the little things really well and the details. And that's how I focused on that. Now, it wasn't easy. It never is. I mean, you can ask and you can Tom Brady. It wasn't easy for him. Uh, But that led to I got injured the end of my first year. I I missed a couple games. And then how do I handle and bounce back from that? And there's so many things. Now, I want to backpedal. I'm sorry, because I was listening to Rebecca and Dr. Martin talk. And I want to say. Coming into the NFL in 2004 is wildly different than young players that have been coming into the NFL this past decade. And what, you ha- what I had to handle as a young player 
Like there, there was no iPhones. There was no social media. All this, these expectations, like right in your face, where you have just Twitter and Instagram and all these things that players these days have to deal with. It was vastly different two deck twenty years ago, and so I, I have seen a lot of players that have had to deal with a lot of extracurricular things that me as a young player, I didn't have to deal with or players, I guess I'll say in my generation, it's hard to say that when I feel like I'm still 25 years old. Um, but, you know, in 2011, I got hurt with six games to go and we had the best team. My fifth year with the um, Houston Texans, we had our best team. We were eight and three, we were rolling and I, I broke my foot essentially. And I missed the last part of that, that season. And the mental side of that, was very hard for me. I mean, you can add my wife, God bless her. She was there every day. She drove me. I said, cause I, I still wanted to go in at five in the morning. I still wanted to be a part of all the meetings. And I'm on one of the, I don't know if how many people might know, the, like the little knee bicycles, just so I could go to meetings and practice and be a part of the team. And that for me was my mental health check every day was still being around my teammates, still being or having a support system to lean on in those times. I think that's where a lot of guys have trouble with handling a lot of the mental aspects and handling adversity because there's so many ways to communicate with athletes these days directly. And too many guys, in my opinion, are open and out front of that. And it, it's tough for them. Guys have a lot of hard times dealing with hardships and the adversity of an injury of not you know dropping a pass throwing an interception throwing four interceptions for touchdowns in four straight games which I did no one else has ever done that in the NFL history <laughs> and I say that with a smile I mean you got to, you might need to be known for something so how do you handle that and I think too many people look at and and there's an expectation as a professional athlete and especially in the National Football League we're all alpha males that there is no mental health issues. You can't have that. It's a negative thing. That's a negative thing. You have to have mental toughness. You have to be able to handle wins, losses, you know, the ups and downs. How are you going to do that? Coaches have so much going on and, and teams have so much going on for their, their jobs that there's usually not someone looking out for you unless you have, like we were just talking about, people around you that will look out for your best interest and have a good team, a support system to be able to check in with you, whether it's good or bad and just see how you're doing mentally. And you have to be honest with yourself. How are you doing? Do a mental health check on yourself um, at those times and be honest with yourself. And I think that's where things have transitioned the last five or six years to where, listen, it's not a negative. It's not a negative. This is part of your well being to be able to go out and perform at a high level. And I think, Everyone is understanding that and being able to find the resources to help manage that side of themselves. We, we've had the good fortune of working together, Dr. Martin, for years. And one of the things I, I knew that I had to do early on was to refer to you as a, uh, a performance coach, right? A success coach. Because if I introduced you as a, a, a psychologist, there would be this pushback, right? There's would say, wait a minute, I don't need a psychologist. There's nothing wrong with me, <laughs> right? When that's not the point. It's not that there's something wrong with you. It's that you're human. And because you're human, you're going to be impacted by stressors in certain ways that can contribute to your success or your failure, right? Mm -hmm. it, it swings both ways. And one of the other things you've heard me preach over and over and over again for years, and I think it's, you know, Matt, you're dead on when you, you bring this up. It's very different nowadays. Uh, and that is your personal life and your professional life are inextricably linked, right? So when you get to the NFL or the NBA or any, any level of, of professional sports where your profile is very, very high and you're visible, um, whatever's going on in your personal life that's problematic can impact your performance. And if it impacts your performance and it's not addressed, then the, the performance professionally will boomerang back and further impact your personal life. And that's what I was referring to earlier in, in, in our, our discussion, this idea of the conflict spiral, right? That something happens that triggers a reaction and you're not prepared or don't know how to deal with it. And the next thing you know, 
you know, it's gotten worse. So really quickly, Matt, I want to pivot back to what you brought up, which was I remember vividly the 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 spate of games with the, the pick six, pick six, pick six. And that was exacerbated by a coach who, if I remember correctly, threw you under the bus <laughs> publicly, right? And said, well, our quarterbacks got to do a better job, right? And meanwhile, you're carrying that home, right? And it impacted mm-hmm. your family relationship, uh, which then probably put more pressure on you going back to trying to not throw the pick six in the fourth game, right? And, and it inevitably led to, you know, fans showing up at your house, right? Um, so if you want to talk about that a little bit, and then I want to yeah. get Rebecca and, and, and Dr. Martin's feedback. Yeah, I sure do. So I was fortunate to have a coach, yes, that did say that. I was also fortunate to have a coach at the, at the same guy praise when was needed and he but he he was the same guy he had, he held me to that standard so I, I did not mind that I think it was also an organizational thing a not a, a not very supportive from the top down sort of structure but I mean there are four throws there was a lot of good ones in between those four throws but that fourth game I got it out of the way real quick it was the third play of the game so I just said let me just get this record on the, on the books and move on um, but you know, it was hard. Yes. I could handle cause I had dealt with some hardships on the football field. Yes. That was very different because we had a very good football team on paper. We had the previous two years, we won division championships, went to the second round of the, the playoffs. So the expectations were there. And when you have this happening and you're at the root cause of it, that is very troublesome. And that was hard for me. And I had, you know, it was very, very much a mental health issue for me. And it did go back home with my wife, three kids, not in a negative way towards them, but they had to deal with it because I'm grumpy. I'm miserable coming home. How do, how am I at the dinner table um, at bedtime? You know, that was very trying to compartmentalize stuff going on at football and then home separating those two things. Granted, my family life was so supportive, but yes, when I get a call the next Wednesday, uh, before uh, going out to practice from our security team security guy and saying that um, there's some reporters outside your house because it was reported some cars pulled up and were right there kind of at the end of the driveway yelling things as at, at the house at like 11 in the morning. And my wife's out on the driveway towards the back of the house with my kids just riding their little scooters around. Like that's, that's where I drew the line. That's where it really became like, this is, what are we doing? What is going on? Why is this? But that 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 drove me even to a stranger place. And, um, you know, we sent security over and we handled it and everything was OK. But still, then the reporter stayed for a couple of days. Wonder what's going to happen at the Shab household now. And it was we're playing a football game. But to a lot of people, that was something a lot bigger. Um, but yeah, that 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 was the end of the road in Houston after that season. That's when I got traded to the Oakland Raiders and. And on we went, but that was, a, that was probably the most troublesome period of time for me as a professional athlete. Um, and then to piggyback on that, you referenced the burning of the jerseys. Well, it was probably after that game, that fourth game of that season, about four weeks later, that same coach put me in. He's like, look, go in there. We're struggling. I need you to go in there and play. This is not working out. Who's playing now? So I go in. And I get hit, kind of rolled up on the back of my leg and, you know, sprained my high ankle, sprain on my ankle and like a little twist of the knee and um, had to stay down for, you know, like 10, 20 seconds, right? I couldn't just pop right back up like you want to. And the fans were, it was a home game and the fans are cheering. They're cheering that I was, that I was hurt. And so that was, an, you know, another layer to it. And then that same game is when it got reported, yeah, they had videos because now with Twitter and, and all these different things, all this access to what's going on is so readily available that yeah, fans were burning my Jersey in the parking lot. So. That's great. That's, that's, that's a, a, I appreciate you being so honest and, and it's, it's most people don't understand that, 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 you know, the guys that are, that are out there with the jerseys are, are, they're human beings, right? They just happen to do something that, um, and, and for the students that are out there, I think I know I've spoken to student groups before, you know, you know, the stress you feel when you go to take an exam, but you don't have to take an exam in front of, 
you know, 80,000 people live uh, that then is shown on Sports Center. So if you make a mistake on a question, you're, you're vilified for it. And that, that, that's, just a, that's just the stress of being the athlete in, in the profile that comes with it. That's not, that has nothing to do with the development of the player. That has nothing to do with mental health um, preparation or anything like that. It's just the fact of the matter is that you're under a whole different level of scrutiny. And, and that by itself requires, in my opinion, preparation, right? So, so Dr. Martin, I don't know if you want to uh, weigh in yeah. on that part of it. Yeah, sure. I, I was struck by a number of things you said, Matt. And, and first of all, um, you talked about mental toughness. And this is a term that's used throughout the locker room from coaches, to players, and so forth. It's like, but is that humane? You know, that's the fundamental issue. And, and to your point, Joby, um, and again, I really appreciate your transparency and I hope the, the audience understands or begins to get an understanding or appreciation for what players endure. And it's hard to even predict how to respond to these kinds of things because your mind, you've been taught and you're rewarded for not feeling, but just simply performing. The other thing that you said Matt, that stood out for me was how the organization, and I lead, alluded to this earlier, either supports or doesn't support. So, you know, culture starts from the top. And despite the fact that the league says, you know, let's have mental health, let's do this, let's do X, let's do Y, each team does its own thing. That's just the reality of it. And it's important. It is critically important, I think, for successful organizations and teams to have someone that is aware of the impact that this has that permeates the entire organization. You talked about the trickle down effect that occurred with you, but it also started with the messaging from, and I don't even know anything about the Houston <laughs> team or anything, but it starts from the top, it affects coaches and it affects players and it invariably affects families. So that's why when we initially talked about it, I said, there are some opportunities. And those opportunities start with the changing of the guard with respect to the culture and recognizing, but not just recognizing, but really not, and, and more than even embracing, but implementing strategies and allotment of time to address these kinds of issues because it invariably will affect performance, you know? And, uh, and this is a family thing. So teams talk about, we got to, you know, we're family and all this other stuff, then do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, so. oh, and go, ahead. go ahead, Rebecca. Rebecca, please. I was just going to say, just in terms of the legal aspect, um, it, it was it, just even in your description of what you went through in that period of time, it sounds like it was really important that you had your family there, even though they were suffering with you. And I think that's one of the things that um, we sometimes see when we're working with players, Joby and um, Dr. Martin, that we, a circumstance like that, that we would see coming, that that might, for somebody that doesn't have the same kind of support off the field, that that is uh, something we, we try to watch out for to say, hey, Joby, hey, Dr. Martin, I, I, you know, this happened. I think you should check in on this client. That's something where maybe I would come in and say, okay, we need to get a restraining order against those uh, reporters where, where that's possible. You know, sometimes there's legal action that can be taken, but whether there's actually anything specific legally that can be done or not, it's one of those times when the team approach of checking in to make sure that a player that therefore doesn't then go and do something different, right? You had a family, you had kids, you had a home life, but a lot of these players are young, you know, if we're talking to NFL, which is kind of what we focused on so far. And I meant Simone Boyle, it's not <laughs> Dominic Dawes, but uh, you know, when we're talking about the NFL, um, a lot of them are young single guys and that's, unfortunate truth of the matter is that that's when they um, might get into other types of pro problems that lead to legal issues because that's their outlet for that feeling right her to get rid of that feeling absolutely um, they they, they then frankly, the, we all of us everyone here and everyone that's in the audience will try to find some expression or some vehicle to address something that's going on internally and, you know, when you think about you, Matt, and other players that are extremely visible, I mean, where do you find support? And I think this is where mental health is really 
really becoming in the forefront of sports and, rec and people are recognizing the importance between that and, and performance, which is a question that you raised initially, Joe, but there's a clear relationship. You know, it is no question that in order for players to maximize their performance, they have to be able to emotionally deal with all of the transitions, all the challenges and all of the uncertainty associated with professional sport and even collegiate sport for that matter. And, and this dovetails into one of the first questions that we have, uh, quite honestly, which is this, this overlap. And I, I think if we get if the, the people that are watching this, the audience take anything away from this, it is that the athletes are human just like you. They just happen to do something different. Right. The profile is different. And because of that, there are different stressors and, and, and the stressors hit them in different ways. But the first question is, you know, how are the lessons that you all have learned in helping athletes uh, and their mental health, um, how, how does that translate to the workplace more broadly, right? And I think we can all speak to that because all of us are no longer playing, <laughs> um, if we ever did, and, and we have real lives now, right? So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and start with Rebecca and then work our way around. How does it translate to real life? What plays yeah, how does it translate to the workplace more broadly? But the, 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 what you've learned about the importance of managing mental health with athletes, how does that impact you? How does it impact, yeah. you know? I mean, yeah. I, I think what you said, Joby, and what um, Dr. Martin said just minutes ago, which is that they're, they're, you know, athletes are human beings too, and that all of us are affected by um, stressors and all of us uh, uh, react according to those stresses and not always in the most healthy way. Um, so I, I don't think that there's uh, a difference in clients that I've dealt with who are not athletes and their need for that support. I do think the stressors are different, right? And, the, and sort of the magnification, like Matt um, said, I mean, athletes have always been under a microscope, but the extra microscope of social media, uh, I believe, adds more pitfalls, more potential for pitfalls and more stressors, right? I mean, if you can keep a client from reading comments, you're in good shape, right? But do you, like when Matt was, uh, when you said he was getting his jersey uh, burned in effigy, when you think about going onto uh, an article about you and reading comments below saying you're a piece of crap, right? And, you know, you ruined my life because I paid for a ticket to your game and you lost. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's, it's sometimes hard to convince clients to stay off of social media um, and, to, and to let go of what other people outside of the people that really should matter think of them. And I think that that's true, whether it's an athlete or, um, you know, a, a guy working at McDonald's. Dr. Martin, you, you, you've worked with uh, also non-athletes. Um, and, and there's some similarity maybe with the entertainers you've worked with or with corporate CEOs because of the special stressors they encounter, but generally in the workplace. What, from a mental health standpoint, um, do you see translating into uh, workplace just more broadly? I mean, I think we all live at a time where there are more expectations that are placed on us. You know, just the nature of life and the demands that are placed on not only us, our children, and just the world that we live in. And so, I mean, I think the high-performing person, if you will, uh, the executive, the, you know, the person who works uh, or is a performer, I mean, we all have to make things happen and how we internalize. And there's so much value placed on doing something, being something, rather than being human and recognizing that a failure is simply an opportunity to learn and to grow. And um, we're evaluated, you know, constantly. So I think really, you know, my experience talking to people, including myself and family members is, and I actually had this conversation with my daughter today. She, she didn't do as well. I hope she's not on this. She's a you know, high performing individual. Um, she said, dad, I didn't get an A. And I said, well, you know, sweetheart, please, please understand. We've said this to you many times. It's okay. That is not who you are. That's one part of what you're doing right now. But you, you are much more than an A to me. And I, I really, this is something that I, I, I push because I know 
that my, my kids don't believe me when I say this, so I have to repeat it because there are a lot of high expectations for, I mean, for all the students that are on, on this uh, Zoom right now. I'm, I'm sure that you're conflicted if you don't get an A, but that's just one part of an experience that you have for a larger part of your life. It's the experience that you gain and glean from all of those experiences, getting A's, getting B's, maybe even getting a C, or maybe even failing a class and having to take it over Mm -hmm. Because now sets in the, the reality of uh, either I'm going to flee or I'm, I'm going to persevere and, and develop the resilience that will be necessary to raise a family. So, you know, I say all of this to say that, yeah, fundamentally, we all want validation, recognition and, you know, feel good. But really taking time out to recognize who we are is really, really important. And I love when I hear Matt who's had such a long and storied career to have the energy, for example, this is an illustration, I know this is a fun for you, but you know, to have that attitude, that warmth and that resilience and the kindness to, to even share with other individuals, that's what you want ultimately, you know? So, and that's not about money, that's about life. So, exactly. So there's another question, and uh, Matt, I'm going to let you take the first whack at this. One. What are the best strategies to balance the stressors of being a student and an athlete at an institution like a Duke or a Virginia, um, if you can remember back that far? Um, and and uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm sure it's easier at Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can see I'm the outcast probably on this entire uh, call. Yeah, I think that's so. <laughs> yeah, I think, well, fortunately, as a student athlete, early on as a, as a redshirt freshman and read to be my first and second year at the University of Virginia, you're, all, you're afforded so many opportunities for assistance, right? You have study halls, you, your time is so structured. And you, you know, especially that first fall, you know, when you're, you're, you're going to class, you have meetings, you have practice, then you have study hall and everything's so regimented. And I think if you can really immerse yourself in that regimen and that schedule that, and it becomes a, a, a normal thing throughout the spring and then the next fall. And if you can become normalized in that routine, it, it's a whole lot easier because, and I'll give you an example, okay? It wasn't easy for me. I say this in hindsight, right? My first semester, I thought I was going to, you know, be the ruler of the University of Virginia. I got a 3.5 GPA, right? I know that's nothing to everyone on this call, but for me, I was like, this is fantastic. Everyone said Virginia is so hard. This is easy. My next, my first spring, played a lot of video games, enjoyed the college life. I had a 2.5 that, that semester. So I ended my first year with a 3.0. I thought I was like, okay, my parents were a little disappointed in that. What are you going to do about it the next fall? And it went back up. So I had to adjust and learn how to handle the student side of student athlete going into my second, second year. And, but that structure of football and off season conditioning and all those things helped me to manage those tough times of being a student as well as being an athlete. But the one thing I will say, if you take all the help that they is offered, whether it's through counselors, whether it's through tutors, if you take advantage of those, it's a whole lot easier than when you try to do it on your own. I, I will juxtapose my experience with yours. Um, so I went to a really, really good private high school. Uh, my coaches convinced me to apply to Duke and North, I mean, and uh, Harvard, Harvard and Duke ended up being my final choice. I almost went to Harvard. I ended up going to Duke. I started as a freshman at Duke. Uh, my first game that I started, uh, I had two interceptions, was ACC Player of the Week. Um, I had a great season uh, on the field. Uh, we had our first winning season forever. Um, and I had a C2Ds and an F. And the reason I had a 1-1 GPA was because I started falling behind in the schoolwork and I was afraid, embarrassed to ask for help. Right. And what I did to self-medicate, thank goodness it wasn't substance abuse, but it was what you mentioned, I went to the video game room and I would go there for hours because that was my way of escaping the pressure of having to perform. My first game I played in was at 85,000 people at South Carolina. I went to a little high school where there was, you know, lucky you had a hundred fans and I didn't know how to deal with the stress. And it wasn't as obvious and readily available to support. 
Um, I think that's probably changed over the years, but I think to the extent that you can understand early that asking for help is a sign of strength, it's not a sign of weakness, right? And, and that's true when we talk about that, going back to the other question, how do things you know, carry over broadly to other workplace? It's the same thing. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Asking for help is a sign of strength. It is not a sign of weakness. Surrounding yourself with good people is going to help you, whether you're a professional athlete or, you know, you're, you're working in, in, in any job. Um, having good people around you will help you deal with the stressors that life is going to bring to you. They just happen to impact athletes and people of profile very differently. And that's, that's, that's I think, the purpose of, of this conversation. Um, I, are there other issues? I, we've got a couple other questions in here. Uh, one's very specific that I don't know enough about Calvin Ridley. Uh, I don't know. Do you know about Calvin Ridley's situation, Matt? In the I, well, being that I wasn't on the team this past year, I retired at the end of the 2020 season. I don't necessarily know the nuts and bolts of what is going on with Calvin Ridley. So yeah, so there's a, there's a question. There's a question about Calvin Ridley. Do you take a step in the right direction? The problem is I don't honestly know enough about, I don't know if any of the other panelists to comment on yeah. that. Okay, so I don't want to make a mistake there. Um, so I've got a couple of other questions here. Uh, what can we do better to prepare college athletes for careers not in their sport? That's a great one for probably Rebecca and, and Dr. Martin. I mean, you were, I was, you were an engineer and you decided to go to law school. So that's a good I, right I was. And, uh, <laughs> if you remember, I, I remember that um, when we were at Duke, that uh, our, our fellow classmates often were discouraged from uh, picking majors that it mm -hmm. seemed that perhaps uh, the uh, football powers that be thought would be pretty strenuous. Um, I remember, you know, our friend Howard in particular, who was also an engineer, he was uh, a year behind us, but I remember it was very difficult for Howard to convince them that he should be allowed to major in engineering. And yet Howard was preparing for life after football. Um, so one thing I think is to, to, to find out what players' passions are and to try to help them along that path rather than discourage them, which perhaps they don't do it all anymore, but, uh, but they did do it with Howard. And I remember many discussions with Howard and so, um, somewhat, uh, I wouldn't say mentoring, but because he was a year behind me, somewhat mentoring him to, uh, to help him to stay in the engineering program. He of course went on to be a Navy uh, pilot and actually works as an engineer even though I don't. So he was able to, to navigate that successfully. But, but I do think that it's important to, um, to have a program. It's, it's got to come from the program, right? Her, sure. David, I mean, yeah, well, you know, my that. thought about it is that when players uh, who are really at that point, let's say they're in their junior or senior year, really uncertain about what they want to do, I really talk to them about translatable skills. You know, so a lot of times players will say, man, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do that. I mean, first of all, you have to be focused. You generally have to be disciplined unless you're, you know, a savant on the football or basketball or, you know, whatever the athletic field is. So, I mean, you have to have perseverance, really uh, resilience. You have to have drive. You have to be able to plan. You have to be a strategist. All of those things are translatable skills to the world of business, you know, the at law, you know, all of those kinds of things. And those things sometimes can be enhanced by someone like, for example, you or people that work in the advising office to, you know, encourage them to look in and further explore other parts of themselves. That's why I think it's so important that they do that early on. Uh, and sometimes it might just be taking career aptitude tests early on. And so I, I've, I've encouraged players to not walk down that path that they can't because that's the messaging that they get very early on. You are a football player or a basketball player or whatever the case may be. I, I may be able to put a, put a bow on this. I, I, okay. I, I, even though I represent professional athletes for a living, uh, I do exactly what that question uh, addressed, which is how do you prepare them for the career ending? Right? So 
the career may end after college, may end during college, but it's going to end. I don't care if you're a Hall of Famer, right? And at some point, you are never going to wear a football helmet again. You're never going to get paid to dribble a basketball or whatever the sport is. And to not prepare for what will inevitably happen is mm -hmm. crazy, right? And But rarely are the athletes uh, managed like that. It's almost always you know, oh, don't worry, there's next year, or don't worry, there's next year, when all of a sudden that year comes when there is no next year. And if all you've done, and this is the biggest mistake that athletes can make, if you thought of yourself as an athlete, if I thought of myself, which I did, as a football player named Joby Branion, um, it opened me up to the, the problem that I encountered, which was the day that they, that I never, that I didn't wear a, ha a helmet again, right? I, I took it off after we played the New York Jets, and I never played, I never put a helmet on again. And then all of a sudden, I felt like a failure because I literally went from being one of the best in the world at what I did to being told I'm not good enough to do it anymore. Hmm. Right. As opposed to being Joby Brannion. And one of the things I do is play football. Right. Because then when you stop playing, you're still that person. Right. If you allow yourself to be identified as the athlete first, you are going to have a problem when it's time to stop being an athlete. Whereas if you are that person who happens to be an athlete, the transition is it can be made more complete. And Dr. Barton, you've been great at helping uh, me help our clients uh, in that endeavor. I know we're running short on time. Um, are there other, uh, does anybody on the panel have anything else they wanted to say before we have to pivot? No? Yeah, I'll say one thing, Joby, yeah, if ahead. you mind. Uh, is anyone on here, don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to face adversity. Um, you know, because a lot of the growth and maturity and then things that you find is you become stronger from having dealt with a little bit of failure. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a failure, like an F on a test or anything like that, but just some hard times create better people and, you know, stronger people mentally. And the other thing I'll say, and Dr. Martin, you probably touch on it better than I, but the mental health aspect to me, it doesn't have to, we sounded so negative through all the things that happened in my career. There are a lot of good things that happened. I think if we can also be proactive on the positive side, it, when things are going really good and you're winning a lot of games or you're doing really well in life, it's always good to check in mentally with yourself. How is that influencing decisions you're making or things that you're doing with your life, you know, on, when things are going positively? Because sometimes that could lead you down some tough paths in the future if you're not careful. And I think that being proactive rather than reactive to some of the things with your mental state is important. No, I love that. And one of my good friends always talks about the difference between mental illness and mental health. And that, you know, I think many times people frame mental health like, you know, there's a problem and to your point. I mean, we have to deal with our mental health every decision that we make, right? Just about. And so that there are many things that happen in, during the course of your life, you want to be able to continue to bolster. And, and that has to do with your, the way you look at the world, the way you look at a specific situation. And you take that and you grow from those experiences. So I said earlier, you know, failure is an opportunity. It's really how you perceive or interpret that event. So I totally agree with you. I think all of us on this, on the Zoom are living proof of that, you know? <laughs> You know, we had to say different things and we experience things daily with our children and, and our family members that are not necessarily what we want, but they're incredible opportunities to learn. So, Well, I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, Brian is back and he's about to give me the hook, I think. 